Thank you for looking after our one-year-old Arya for a year. We're off to pick up my daughter now. The two, Anthony and Chloe, got married triggered by Chloe's pregnancy, but their reckless behavior often disrupted my life. Requests to watch the child or for money were endless. When I refused to care for the child, they would leave granddaughter Arya near my house without a word, leaving me no choice. Then one day, suddenly, there was no contact, and Arya was nowhere to be seen. Just when I thought it was resolved, I was about to learn an unwelcome truth. What do you mean, I haven't been looking anyone? Huh? Chloe and Anthony insisted they had left Arya with me. Hearing their story, the worst-case scenario crossed my mind. Parents who abandon their child to gallivant abroad for a year cannot be called parents. I decided to fight, collaborating with someone. It's pitiful for Arya to be raised by such unaware adults. What will happen when their true nature is revealed? I am Camila, still working at the local department store at 65. After giving birth to my sons Anthony and Luke, I divorced and raised them alone. Luke, the free spirit, expresses himself well, while Anthony, the elder, is a bit shy. After high school, Luke went hitchhiking abroad without hesitation and now lives overseas alone. Anthony, unlike Luke, tends to retreat into his shell. He has complained about the struggles of working in a factory and living alone but seems to be managing. It's been about 23 years since Anthony moved out. One day, I received a call from Anthony. His excited voice came through immediately after I answered. Hey mom, there's someone I want you to meet. Anthony called excitedly. What's the rush? Just look forward to it. The call from Anthony ended quickly. On the day we agreed, Anthony came home looking unrecognizable. It's been a while, what's with that outfit? He was dressed as if a mannequin from a shopping mall had outfitted him. I stumbled into a store with a friend and felt destiny from that day. There was a considerably young woman next to Anthony. What's this all about? Hello, I'm Chloe. The woman introducing herself as Chloe greeted me in a high-pitched voice. Oh, uh, nice to meet you. And your relationship is? Didn't Anthony tell you? Chloe hit Anthony's back hard enough to make but Anthony didn't seem to mind and smiled. I'm going to be a dad soon. He said, looking at Chloe with his nostrils flaring. That's right. I'm seven months pregnant now. I could only alternate my gaze between a smiling Chloe, caressing her belly, and a happy Anthony. Seven months pregnant means you're married to Anthony? Well, something like that. Normally, if there's a feeling of wanting to announce a marriage or pregnancy, shouldn't it be shared a bit earlier? I looked at Chloe again, but still, it didn't add up. Chloe seemed quite young, but do people generally want to marry someone significantly older, like Anthony? At a glance, Chloe and Anthony could even be mistaken for parent and child. However, I thought it odd to point this out here and kept it to myself. Oh, right. That's what I came to say today. She pulled out a mobile phone from her bag, opened a certain online shopping website, and showed it to me. Is something wrong with the bag on the screen? The screen displayed a bag from a high brand. I want this as my baby gift. I want to get it before my favorite celebrity's birthday party, so please make sure it's this month. She was asking for a super famous brand bag costing over $5,000. Baby gifts are traditionally given after the birth, and besides, I've never heard of giving such an expensive bag as a gift. I work too, so I have a bit of financial leeway. I was willing to help in any way I could, but what's the right move here? It didn't seem right to refute Chloe's request upon our first meeting. Feeling this, I decided to ask Chloe why she wanted the expensive bag so much. I see you want it badly, can I ask why? Then, Chloe changed her expression and looked at me with a beaming smile. 
This person is my favorite celebrity. It's a collaboration bag, and as a fan, I just have to have it. Chloe operated her mobile phone and showed me the screen. A website with a modern-day idol holding the bag. The man's photo was featured prominently. Oh, I see. Still unsure of what to do about the baby gift, I decided to think it over for a while. I'll ponder what to do after getting the news that the baby has been born. While I was thinking this, Anthony contacted me to say the baby was born. Relieved that the birth went well, I sent a text. I heard from Anthony. Relieved to hear everything went well. Congratulations on the birth. Please rest up now. However, I soon got a reply from Chloe, but what was written was something I never anticipated. Lucky we made it in time. The deadline for depositing for that bag is tomorrow. Cash is fine. Please send it over. My head began to ache at the audacity of her position. Normally, I would speak up if something seemed odd. However, I didn't want to sour our relationship here, and more importantly, I shouldn't stress Chloe out right after giving birth. Without much thought, I decided to give $1,000 in cash as a gift. Four days after I sent the money, I got a call from Anthony. Hey mom, what's this about? Because of you, Chloe's bedridden right after getting discharged. Me? How am I related to her being bedridden? She won't get out of bed because she says the gift from you isn't enough for the bag. Now I have to take care of Aria and can't even go to work. It seems they named the baby Aria. A name I learned only through this call. Chloe was so fixated on the bag she wanted that she forgot to even mention her name. Are you saying she's bedridden because the gift wasn't enough to buy her the bag? Yeah. Stop making Chloe upset and try to get along with her. But I sent what I thought was a respectable amount for a parent. I didn't expect her to be bedridden over this. Dealing with such unreasonable demands was something I was tired of. Yet, unaware of how I felt, Chloe kept contacting me. Usually to ask for something or to make inconvenient requests. I'm sure on living expenses this month. Her tone suggested she was waiting for me to send money. I decided not to fall for it and played dumb. That sounds tough. Things are hard here too. Just send $500 for now. Demanding a significant amount out of the blue, what was she thinking? Even if you suddenly ask for $500. Then, can you look after Aria for a bit? That wouldn't cost you anything, right? I was willing to help within my means, but I have work too and can't always be available. Regardless of my situation, Chloe frequently asked me to babysit. Could you play with Aria the day after tomorrow? I can't take the day off because it's a sale period. Why not hire a babysitter? Chloe responded with a tone that made her displeasure obvious. How can you be so heartless and leave our baby with strangers? Are you saying you're okay with leaving her with someone you don't know? Her confrontational behavior took me by surprise. It's not about being okay with it. I'm just saying it's hard when you suddenly ask me to take care of her. I have work and other commitments too. The call ended there. But this was just the beginning of unbelievable actions. On the day Chloe asked me to take care of the child, as I was about to leave for work. I noticed something resembling a basket near my apartment. Curious about the oddly placed basket, I approached and felt warmth. Hearing faint breathing, I lifted the cover to find a baby wrapped in a towel embroidered with the name Aria, sleeping. What is this? It says Aria, that's Anthony's child. In a panic, I tried calling Anthony, but it went to voicemail. When I called Chloe, she answered. Hello, Camila. Why so early in the morning? What are you thinking, leaving Aria silently in front of my place? Then, Chloe answered lazily. 
Because the event of my favorite celebrity was decided, I couldn't help it. I thought you wouldn't mind taking care of Arya. You could have consulted earlier or contacted in some way. What if she got hurt or kidnapped being left at my doorstep like that? It's a bit much to worry about, isn't it? You're overthinking. Eventually, I couldn't just take the day off on such short notice and had to leave Arya with a nearby babysitter to go to work. From that day on, Chloe started leaving Arya at the front of our apartment. On days I wasn't working, I took care of her, thinking it wasn't the child's fault. But leaving her like this every time without notice was troublesome, so I installed a security camera. Fortunately, since then, there hasn't been a basket with Arya in it left. Maybe Chloe finally woke up to her responsibilities as a mother. However, about 10 months later, my expectations were shattered. During a rare day off at home when the phone rang. It was Anthony, and his voice seemed a bit too cheerful. Speaking as if joy and excitement were mixed in his voice. Hey mom, it's been a while. You're home, right? Yes, but it's been about a year, hasn't it? What's the sudden call for? Then, from the other end of the phone, Chloe, unexpectedly, spoke up. Thank you for taking care of Aria for a year. Anthony, snatching the phone, overlapped with Chloe's words. We're coming to pick up Aria now. I was completely lost at what the two were saying. What do you mean, I haven't been looking anyone? Oh come on, mom. We're already on our way to the nearest station. It's been a long time since I've been back home and I want to drink the coffee you make. Despite of everything, it was kind of you to care her for a year. Their answers made no sense to my questions, and I couldn't understand their conversation at all. What? You're saying I've been looking after Aria? Who else but mom? I can't wait to hear Aria's voice. Anthony's carefree voice could be heard. I was scared by this baseless claim, fearing the worst. I don't know what you're talking about. Huh? From the other end of the phone, I could hear Chloe and Anthony talking. I have no idea what you're talking about. Isn't Aria with you right now? Oh Camila, stop joking. You can't say that right after coming back home. Coming back home means you've been somewhere? Then Chloe's voice faltered, and everything went silent. Hey, explain what you mean by left her? Where's Arya? After my question, the phone call ended. As I was trying to call Anthony, I saw him and Chloe running towards the apartment balcony. I could clearly see them coming towards here, pulling suitcases. The doorbell rang, and when I went to the door, Anthony and Chloe were there, drenched in sweat. What's going on? Where's Arya? So, I told you, I don't know. Why are you asking me? Because we left the basket here before we left. Chloe stuttered in her response, and Anthony looked uneasy. We thought she'd be safe with you. I had installed a security camera because you two had left Arya here without notice before. But nothing was captured on the recording. We thought we left her where it would be obvious. Wait, what should we do now? Chloe suddenly became flustered, and Anthony froze, prompting me to fear the worst. Of course, there are blind spots in the camera's view, but what if she was taken from somewhere out of sight? Feeling a sudden surge of fear after suggesting the worst-case scenario to them, I said. We should go to the police. We can't handle this alone. Police? If people find out we went to the police, imagine what people would say. Yeah, there's no need to make such a big deal out of it. Despite the gravity of the situation, Anthony and Chloe's indifferent comments raised my suspicion. How can you say that? We need to start looking for Arya right now. I'll contact the police, so don't do anything unnecessary. Let's just look a bit more before that, okay? Do they have a reason for not wanting to contact the police? 
even with such a suggestion, I couldn't help feeling anxious. Noticing my distress, Chloe loudly clapped her hands as if she had an epiphany. Ah, I remember now. I left her with a friend before we left the country. It's fine, I'll go pick her up now. Is that so? I went straight to the airport from work on the day we left, so I wouldn't know. It's okay. Anthony, you go home first. I'll go to my friend's place and bring Aria back properly. Watching Chloe and Anthony rush off like a storm, I could only stand and watch. Their mannerisms and the way their eyes moved gave me the impression Chloe was lying. Although she said she left Aria with a friend, it seemed unlikely to be the truth. Driven by a desire to resolve the situation quickly, I decided to act on my own without telling Chloe. I searched everywhere, local police stations, child welfare facilities. It turned out that about a year ago, Aria was found in a basket by a passerby and had been under the care of a child welfare facility. It was surprising to find out that there was nothing to clearly identify Aria at the time of her discovery. Except for a towel embroidered with her name. Seemingly, she was left in a blind spot without any surveillance cameras, making it impossible to determine her identity. Being Aria's grandmother, I temporarily took her into my custody. Now, how should I contact them? If I mention the child welfare facility, I can't predict what Chloe might say. While pondering for a good idea, one occurred to me. Following Chloe might reveal something. I remembered Chloe saying she had left Aria with a friend. Perhaps Chloe had someone in mind. I went near Chloe and Anthony's apartment and decided to observe the comings and goings from a nearby cafe. While keeping an eye on Chloe's movements, I arranged for a babysitter to take care of Aria. From the sizable apartment, people who appeared to be residents were continuously entering and exiting when someone resembling Chloe emerged. She quickly left the apartment and started walking. Curious, I decided to follow her. Following Chloe, I could see her entering a restaurant. Luckily, it was a fairly large restaurant, and depending on where one sat, it might be possible to listen in without being noticed. Given that Chloe's child was missing, she wouldn't come to a restaurant without a reason. I managed to get seated at a distance close enough to hear Chloe's conversation without being noticed. After a while, a man around Chloe's age entered the restaurant and sat down across from her. He looked like an average office worker. Contrasting Chloe's preference for flashy makeup and revealing fashion. However, it seemed they had arranged to meet as they greeted each other, asking if the other had been well after a long time. I focused on their voices, trying to pick up any hints from their conversation. Chloe seemed to be calling the man sitting across from her Nathan. Hey, Nathan, how have you been lately? What do you mean by how? You know, like, about the baby? Listening in, it seemed they were talking about a child. From Chloe's manner of speaking, it appeared she was probing this man, Nathan, about Aria. What do you mean, like, about the baby? Never mind, forget it. Anyway, it's been about two years since we split, what's up all of a sudden? Did you need something from me? No, really, it's nothing. I'm going to go now. Deciding it was futile to continue, Chloe grabbed her bag and rushed out of the cafe. Nathan looked confused, not understanding what Chloe was talking about. Thinking I might as well try, I approached Nathan after Chloe had left. Excuse me for the sudden intrusion. May I have a moment? Uh, yes. What is it? I'm the mother-in-law of the woman you were just speaking with, Chloe. I'm sorry for the surprise, but I'm curious about what you were discussing. If it's all right, could you tell me? Initially, Nathan seemed guarded, but as I explained the situation, he relaxed. It seemed understanding I wasn't suspicious and that I was Chloe's mother-in-law made a difference. Chloe's mother-in-law? 
So, Chloe got married? And you mentioned a child just now? Chloe, yes, she has a child. Oh, may I ask your name? Nathan. Nice to meet you. So, about this child. As he said this, he offered his business card. Yes. She married my son about a year and a half or two years ago. I was surprised when she said she was seven months pregnant at the time of their marriage. The child's name is Aria, but she's went missing and we were searching for. Missing? Nathan, looking concerned about the child's well-being, asked. Don't worry. As her grandmother, I took her in, and she's currently with a babysitter. It seems that about a year ago, Chloe left Aria at my house without telling me, but she was taken into care without my knowledge. Nathan's tense expression relaxed. I'm relieved. I've been searching separately from Chloe, and finding out she's been taken care of is also new to me. Is that so? That explains it. I watched Nathan, who seemed lost in thought, his gaze dropping to the floor. Chloe wanted to search for places she had in mind before reporting to the police, so that's why we were searching separately. I showed him a picture of Aria. Chloe really wanted to search on her own, thinking she had a lead. It must have been about you. Then, Nathan, with a troubled look, hesitantly spoke. I told Chloe I didn't know what she was talking about regarding the child, but considering the timing, that child might actually be mine. Mine? I thought so, but sorry, I shouldn't have said that. He chuckled awkwardly, as if trying to dismiss his previous statement. Aria is your and Chloe's child? She's now one year old, and when you met, Chloe was seven months pregnant, right? I just thought maybe. I was so shocked that I struggled to find the words. That can't be, but when I think about it, the timeline matches. I was incredibly busy with work at one point, unable to see Chloe often, and that's when she broke up with me via text, unilaterally. Then she blocked my calls. Really? Nathan nodded emphatically. Chloe said she needed to undergo cancer treatment and that we shouldn't see each other anymore. But from what you've told me, I realized that was a lie. What would you do if Aria really is your child? Nathan seemed contemplative but then looked up decisively. If Aria is indeed mine and Chloe's child, I want to take responsibility for raising her. Someone who leaves their own child on someone's doorstep is not fit to be a parent. Having heard your story, I think we should consider a DNA test. Nathan looked surprised. A DNA test, as in? Yes. At this point, wouldn't you want to know if you're Aria's dad? I would definitely like to proceed if possible. The day I learned about at-home DNA tests from a documentary and thought of trying one, I ordered a test kit. The time to use it had arrived. I hurried home to fetch it and returned to Nathan. I have Aria's hair, so if I can get some of yours, we can quickly get the results. Wow, they have stuff like this now? We decided to use the DNA kit, which allowed for easy testing with just hair samples. After exchanging contact information with Nathan, we parted ways, but I remember feeling anxious until the results came. Three days after sending the test kit to the lab, the results arrived by mail. The DNA test confirmed Nathan was indeed the dad. There was only one thing left for me to do. It was time to bring everything into the open. I decided to invite Chloe and Anthony to my house. Aria has been found safe. Could you come over to my place? I had picked up Aria from the babysitter and waited for Chloe and Anthony to arrive. About four hours after my call, Anthony and Chloe came into the house and exaggeratedly approached Aria. So she's been found. You made such a commotion, Aria. Dad's here. Aria, you've grown. They tried to hug her with open arms as if it were a touching reunion. 
Arya looked puzzled for a moment and then started crying. Right then, Nathan appeared from the next room. You abandon your own child at Camilla's place and that's your opening line? What kind of thought process is that? Who's this? Don't interfere with our family matters. Anthony, though bold in his words, clearly shook in the presence of a man larger and unknown to him. Chloe, on the other hand, seemed desperate to figure out how to navigate the situation. No, he's like a friend or relative, sort of. What? So, he is a stranger. Please leave. Anthony glared as he waved his hand dismissively. Nathan, holding the results of the DNA test that proved he was Aria's father, thrust them into Anthony's face. I used to date Chloe, planning to marry her. But suddenly, she said she needed cancer treatment and couldn't see me anymore, and that was it. So? What does that have to do with me? Maybe Chloe just wanted to get away from you by lying. Nathan, shaking with anger, raised his voice in response. And then find her marrying you. You got to be kidding me. Whether Chloe understood Nathan's feelings or not, she counted her split ends while replying. Well, I wanted to live with someone wealthy. I was torn between Nathan and Anthony. But I chose Anthony because he seemed to have a promising future, just thinking about the child and myself. So, while you were promising to marry me, you were also seeing him? Chloe turned to Anthony, smiling brightly. Because Anthony is a manager at a famous company. He said becoming a department head in a few years isn't a dream. Investing in the child so it can support us later isn't a bad idea, right? Anthony, getting carried away, bragged. Well, when you work for a company like mine, you don't have to worry about money. It's easy to provide for a child, allowing them to live freely. Unbelievable. First of all, why would you do something terrible like leaving a child on the street? You have money because you work for a famous company? Don't joke with me. If so, use that money to properly care for the child. Anthony, faced with this sound argument, began to falter, his confidence from moments ago seemingly a lie. Why? Well, it's too early for a small child to go abroad, you know? Besides, asking mom to take care of Arya, she'd be happy. Anthony's gaze seemed almost pleading for help. Because it would make mom happy? Don't use your child to please your parents. Besides, even if it wasn't your mom, anyone would be annoyed by having a child left on their doorstep without permission. That you don't understand this by your age is unbelievable. Besides, even if it wasn't your mom, anyone would be annoyed by having a child left on their doorstep without permission. That you don't understand this by your age is unbelievable. I gave Nathan a standing ovation in my mind. Well said. However, both Anthony and Chloe seemed to not grasp the meaning of his words, looking stunned. It's truly unbelievable that there are parents who can't take responsibility for and cherish their own child. I especially can't forgive it since I was abandoned by my parents as a child. I will raise Arya. Just as Nathan was about to embrace Arya, Anthony stood up. There's no way a young single man like you can raise her. Come on, mom, say something to this ridiculous man. If it continues like this, Arya will be taken away. Is that okay? I was despairing over how shallow Anthony could be. Someone who leaves their child on someone else's doorstep for selfish reasons doesn't deserve to be a parent. No, I mean, I won't do it anymore. He looked at me with a face like a child making excuses. It's not about what you will or won't do from now on. Can we trust the words of someone who does such a thing? Then Chloe approached me with a sweet, coaxing voice, trying to appease me. Come on, Anthony is saying so, please forgive him. On what grounds are you speaking? 
I glared at Chloe with all my might. After all, you chose Anthony because of his money, even though you were dating Nathan before. I didn't want to lower my standard of living. Thinking about the future, having money is better, right? I can't stand being poor. At that moment, Nathan stood up. No matter how much I think about it, I can't leave my child with someone who would abandon her. I'll go to court to gain custody if I have to. It's impossible for someone without money like you. She's my child, and it's too late to say such things now. Chloe's face suggested she believed she hadn't said anything wrong. Camila agrees with me, right? She's your precious granddaughter. Don't talk nonsense. Aria would be pitiful if left in your care. Hey, you think it's right to say those things? Anthony stood up, looking down at me as I remained seated. I decided it was time to enlighten Chloe about Anthony's true situation. Hey, you. I don't know if you think Anthony has money, but do you know how much he really has? Chloe responded with a stunned face. But he's a manager at a famous company. A manager at a famous company? In reality, he's a subcontractor for a subcontractor of a famous company. Just mentioning the name of a famous company, and you didn't realize? Chloe looked shocked, but I continued without concern. Moreover, what Anthony has is mostly debt. That too, from spending on games. Before marrying you, he was so desperate over game debts that he came crying to me, and I had to pay them off. Anthony's face turned red with anger, having his undesirable past dug up. Hey, why bring that up now? It's irrelevant. Irrelevant? Maybe it is. But I'm done being manipulated by you too, and it's clear what should be done for Aria's sake. You can't be serious. Tearing apart a child and her mother is the lowest. That's unthinkable. Chloe, shaking, glared at the floor. Tearing apart? Aren't you the one who did that by treating her like an abandoned child for a year without permission? You have no right to say anything now. There's nothing more for me to say here, and if you keep this up, we'll end up settling this in court. Go ahead and take it to court. The court will favor the mother. Actually, you should pay child support. Let's say, I'll settle for $2,000 a month. Chloe's attitude suggested she was making a concession. Deciding further discussion was futile, Nathan left the negotiation table. Eventually, the custody battle went to court, and Nathan was awarded custody of Aria. Following that, Chloe and Anthony fought daily and ended up divorcing. Even after the divorce, they continued blaming each other, citing lack of money, with no end in sight. Anthony continued pretending to work at a well-paying company. While Chloe, aware of the real parentage yet choosing to conceal it, got what she deserved. A few months after Chloe and Anthony's divorce, Working as usual, I thought I saw a familiar figure in the sales area. I hoped I was mistaken, but as the figure approached, my suspicion turned to certainty. Well, well, Camila. Long time no see. I just wanted to see your face, so I dropped by. She approached with a sly smile. The place I'm currently working at features trendy items often highlighted in magazines. Oh, this wallet is lovely. Oh, wait. This is. The moment Chloe turned her back to pick up the wallet, she turned around with an expression of feigned shock. Oh dear, there's a scratch on the wallet behind you. You were rearranging the shelves earlier, right? Maybe you scratched it then? She pressed the wallet into my hands with a sly grin. It's okay. If you pay for it, I'll forgive you. But, this design is a bit too flashy for you, so I don't mind taking it off your hands. I knew she was shameless, but her actions were too low. 
Oh dear, a scratch on the merchandise. Let me check that for you. While she pretended to accidentally scratch the merchandise and tried to make me pay for it under the guise of compensation. I called security to check the surveillance cameras. The current surveillance technology is excellent. Capturing Chloe secretly scratching the wallet's charm with a concealed sharp object. With Chloe's suspicious actions recorded, there was no room for her to deny it. Let's have a detailed conversation over here. Further investigation by the store revealed that Chloe had been engaging in similar nuisance behaviors sporadically. She was finally banned from the store and handed over to the police for her malicious actions. Spending some time under police care. I haven't been in contact with Anthony, as I can no longer handle his issues. As an adult, he should take care of his own problems. While I regret having indulged them, it's time they realized their responsibilities on their own. I hear nothing good about Anthony from his acquaintances and colleagues. Stories of Dinan dashes or pretending to collect donations only to run off with the money. Anthony, with his high pride, fails to recognize how much trouble he causes for others. Or perhaps he can't. If he ever seeks help out of desperation, I'm likely the first he'd turn to. Considering this, I decided to move without telling him my new address. It was timely since living in my previous apartment had become uncomfortable. Since moving to my new home, I've been enjoying fulfilling days. There's a gym nearby, and I make sure to get in a little exercise every day. Sweating lightly from the exercise feels great, almost like I'm rejuvenating. It turns out Nathan lives nearby and after running into him at the local supermarket, we become like friends who occasionally chat. Arya, whom I used to care for, has grown a lot and now runs around the park. Though Arya and I don't share a direct blood relation, I changed her diapers and looked after her, fostering a connection. I'm happy to still be able to watch her grow. From now on, my daughter and her husband will live in this house, so you need to leave. Suddenly, I, Rosa, was told by my M.I.L. Loretta to leave the house. To add insult to injury, my husband Arnold handed me a piece of paper. Huh? What's this? You'll understand once you see it. It's a divorce application. Originally, this house was purchased with my savings. Arnold who only works part-time, couldn't possibly afford it with his monthly income. Despite Loretta and Arnold wanting to live together, I complied with their request. Why do I have to suffer like this? Well, all right. I understand. As I said this, the two of them were overjoyed. Now, at last, the nuisance is gone from this house. I didn't expect her to leave so easily. These people are definitely going to hell. Just you wait, I'll make sure you two are the only ones who won't have it good. Three years ago, I married Arnold, who I initially met at the same trading company. After getting married, I resigned, but there was a reason for this. While working as an employee at the trading company, I often drew illustrations as a hobby and posted them on social media. At some point, my work caught attention on social media, and I started receiving many requests for illustrations, making up to $10,000 a month at times. I've finally started to make some good money recently. Really? That's great. Hope you can keep earning steadily. While saying this, Arnold supported me in continuing my illustration work remotely, and our married life was going quite smoothly. Five years into our marriage, just when I started thinking about buying our own home, Arnold was laid off. It was due to personnel downsizing amid the recent economic downturn. I've worked so hard for the company, and this is how they repay me. I'm sorry. I didn't know what to say to Arnold, who was apologizing to me in tears. All I could do was to stay by his side until he calmed down. 
A month later, Arnold started a part-time night job at a nearby grocery store, but his income drastically decreased, earning only about $700 a month. I have to work even harder. Since then, I've taken on even more projects, and our savings have significantly increased. With this much, we can afford our own home. Another year passed, and I decided to consult Arnold about buying our dream home. Hey, should we buy our own home soon? Uh. But, you know, I don't earn much. Leave that part to me. We've saved enough, it's all good. Arnold, looking somewhat apologetic, responded to my confident declaration. Well, I know this might sound strange to ask, but could we get a house where my mom can live with us too? Dad's passed away, and more importantly, her house is getting old. She even mentioned that if we're building a house, we should live together. Arnold's father had passed away from a heart attack when Arnold was in elementary school. I was grateful to Loretta and understood Arnold's feelings towards her. All right. Got it. Let's respect Loretta's and your wishes and get a house where we can all live together. And so, Arnold, Loretta, and I visited a house builder and signed the contract for our dream home. The interior was largely influenced by Loretta's and Arnold's preferences. I would have preferred it in my own style, but oh well. If the two of them are happy, that's all that matters. That's what I thought, never imagining I'd be betrayed in such a manner. About 10 months after signing for the house, it was finally completed. I even set up a study for work, and it's so comfortable, my illustration work is going well. Rosa, thank you for building such a wonderful home. It's absolutely fine. I'm always grateful for your help. Loretta seemed really pleased too, constantly thanking me, and I was truly glad to see her happy. Life in the new home was smooth at first, but after three months, Loretta's attitude towards me changed. Hey, can you clean my room a bit? Um, I'm a bit busy right now busy? But you're just cooped up in your room doing nothing, right? Arnold's been complaining that you don't work properly. Not working properly? What has Arnold been seeing to say such a thing? After all, this house was built because I worked hard and earned the money. I wanted to retort to Loretta, but thinking that perhaps Arnold hadn't said such a thing, I endured and reluctantly decided to clean her room as she asked. While I was cleaning, Loretta didn't help at all and just relaxed comfortably. After about an hour of cleaning, when I was nearly done, I spoke to Loretta. Oh. Finally finished, I see. I'll be expecting this regularly from now on, thank you. Uh, okay. I was too appalled to say anything. Why should I have to act like your maid? Loretta's remarks were infuriating. But what angered me more was the thought of Arnold. Did he really say I don't work? I decided to confront him about it at dinner. By the way, I heard from Loretta that you've been complaining about me not working? Well, I did mention it a bit. My sister is working hard at the factory, part-time. Sweating it out to earn her keep, and you're always at home, right? Just seemed a bit unfair, you know? Arnold has an older sister named Olive, two years his senior. Olive has a three-year-old child and gets along well with her husband. Our relationship is pretty good, exchanging messages occasionally. Still, I couldn't believe Arnold actually harbored such thoughts. Hearing Arnold's true feelings left me in shock. I thought he was on my side. From the next day, Loretta's treatment of me became even harsher. It started with just cleaning, but gradually escalated to give me a massage and make me some coffee, treating me like a complete maid. Arnold, as usual, had no intention of looking for a full-time job. Hey, isn't it about time you find a full-time job? Quiet. You're earning well, right? Then it's fine. 
Between Arnold's refusal to listen and Loretta's daily demands, my mental state was reaching its limit. Olive. I'm at my breaking point. Please help me. Are you okay? After enduring this life for three months, I sought help from Olive, who acted promptly and sternly addressed Arnold and Loretta. Thanks to Olive, the harassment subsided for about two weeks. Then, one evening, as I was washing the dishes after dinner, Arnold said he needed to talk. What about? Just wait. I've called mom, so sit down and wait. What on earth am I about to be told? I waited on the living room sofa for Loretta and Arnold, feeling frightened. Sorry to keep you waiting. Arnold said you wanted to talk. As I said this, Loretta and Arnold exchanged glances and smirked maliciously. Then Loretta slowly started to speak. This house, it's going to be Olive's family living here. So could you leave? LOL. What? What are they talking about all of a sudden? Confused by the situation, I was just shocked by Loretta's words. Hey, you listening to mom's words? LOL and this. Huh? What's this? Arnold handed me a piece of paper. When I unfolded the half-folded paper, I realized it was a divorce application. I had no idea what Loretta and Arnold were up to. You see? It's a divorce application. Arnold watched my reaction with a laugh. But why must I go through this? I worked hard to buy this house with my own money. What's going on with you two all of a sudden? I appreciate that you bought this house. But the thing is, Arnold has been suffering because you earn more than him. A person who can't show respect to her husband doesn't belong in this house. So, we thought of letting Olive live here instead. Yeah, that's right. You've been having it too good, and honestly. I've been irritated. It's not like I wanted to quit my job. But you kept nagging me to find work. I was sick of it. I see, I see. So, that's why they've been so harsh to me. I'm utterly dismayed by such childish reasoning. Since I bought the house with my earnings, I wanted to tell them they should be the ones to leave. But I'm tired of dealing with them. Ha. Huh. Okay, I understand. So, I should leave, right? Wow. That was quick. With you gone, the nuisance is out of the way, and we can live comfortably. When I agreed to leave, the two of them were ecstatic, holding hands and rejoicing. If that's how they want it, I'll show them. Just you watch. I'll make sure they get what they deserve. At that moment, I decided to seek revenge against the two of them. The next morning, I packed the bare minimum and left the house. Loretta and Arnold saw me off, but they didn't seem to feel sad at all. Make sure you file the divorce papers properly, will you? LOL. Just thinking about not having to see your face anymore is refreshing. We'll take good care of this house, so don't worry. They said whatever they wanted. Don't worry, I won't let you have your way any longer. After leaving the house, I immediately called Olive. Hello? Olive? Hello? What's up? Well, actually. I told Olive that I had been kicked out of the house by Loretta and Arnold. I also mentioned that they said Olive's family would be moving into the house in my place. What? What's going on? Can we meet and talk about this right now? It seemed like Olive was hearing about this for the first time. As she suggested, I headed to a nearby cafe to discuss the details. Five minutes after I arrived at the cafe, Olive entered. Sorry for the sudden call. No, it's totally fine. Besides, I don't have a home to return to anymore. I said it a bit self-deprecatingly, and Olive's expression became serious about that. 
I haven't heard anything about this from mom or Arnold, and I honestly had no idea. My husband and I were actually planning to build a house somewhere else. Really? You didn't know? I had no idea. This was surprising. So Arnold and Loretta lied about all of moving in, just to kick me out. Well, then there's no need to leave that house to him. I'm relieved to hear that. I was actually thinking about selling the house. Even if you were really moving in. This settles it. I'll make sure those two don't get to enjoy it. Yeah, those two have gotten way too cocky. Rosa, you do what you think is best. I definitely can't defend them after all this. It felt good to talk to Olive. I'm glad I could talk to you, Olive. Thank you. After leaving the cafe, I went to the courthouse and first submitted the divorce papers. Then, I headed to a real estate agent and told them I wanted to sell the land and the house, handing over the deed. Those two, unaware of this, are probably living carelessly. Every time I think of their faces, I get infuriated. According to the real estate agent, due to the good location and the newness of the building, a buyer should be found quickly. Please contact me when it's sold. I'll be staying at my parents' house for a while. I left the rest to the real estate agent and went back to my parents' house. When I returned to my parents' house after an hour's drive, my parents were there to welcome me. But they were very surprised as their daughter had returned home so suddenly. Two weeks later, I received a phone call. It seems there was a prospective buyer for the house. They wanted to view the house as soon as possible, and it was scheduled for the upcoming weekend. Can I join you on that day? As a former resident, I think I can guide them through every corner of the house more thoroughly. When I proposed this to the real estate agent, they immediately contacted the prospective buyer, and the reply was, we would appreciate that very much. Ah, your happy life is about to end. I can't stop smiling, imagining their panicked faces. And then, the day of the viewing arrived. As the real estate agent opened the front door, Arnold rushed out in a panic. Who are you? I'll call the police. Arnold yelled angrily, which intimidated the real estate agent, but I spoke up from behind. Don't worry about him. He has no right to say such things. Huh? Rosa? What's going on? Ignoring Arnold, I led the prospective buyer and the real estate agent into the house. So, this is the living room. While I was guiding them through the house, Arnold came to interfere with us, raising his voice again. Hey! Wait! What the hell is going on here? Hearing the commotion, Loretta also arrived. Ah, this is so annoying. What are you doing here? I'll call the police. The police, huh, go ahead and call them. This house isn't yours anymore. I'm really sorry for the disturbance during the viewing. I'll just go and talk to those two, so please feel free to look around. If you have any questions, don't hesitate to ask. With that, I took Arnold and Loretta outside to explain the situation. Arnold's face was red with anger. You were talking about a viewing or something, but why is our house being viewed? Yeah. It's shocking that you just showed up like this. They still don't understand the situation. Then, I'll tell them everything. Our house. What nonsense are you talking about? Listen, I bought this house. My name is the only one on the deed. Also, I talked to Olive. And the story about Olive's family moving into this house was a lie, wasn't it? That, that was, the plan changed suddenly. That happens all the time. Do you think that excuse will work? I spoke directly with Olive and confirmed it. The story you told, Olive had never heard of it before. As I said this to them, 
They bit their lower lips and became speechless. Also, I'll tell you who those people are. I sold this house. So now, the rights to this house belong neither to me nor to you, but to the real estate agency. That's why there are prospective buyers viewing the house today. Do you understand now? But that's so selfish. What about where we will live? I don't know about that. Moreover, if you don't leave soon, you might be reported to the police for trespassing, you know? As I spoke coldly, Arnold and Loretta began apologizing to me with faces that looked like they were about to cry. Don't say such harsh things. Don't abandon us. You know how little I make each month, right? I can't even live properly with that. Look, let's call off the divorce and live together again. Yeah, I think that's best. Such rotten people. I found myself slapping Arnold across the face in a fit of anger. Stop being so spoiled. Who was it that initiated the divorce? Wasn't it you? And isn't your low income because you've been too lazy to look for a job until now? And Loretta, aren't you too convenient, always pampering Arnold and trying to kick me out of the house? Let me tell you, I have no intention of taking care of either of you ever again, and I will never forgive you. Now, choose whether you want to pack your things and leave immediately or if you want me to call the police. I unleashed all my pent-up feelings, panting from the outburst. I'm sorry. We're truly sorry. Whether they were intimidated by me or not, the two of them hastily went back inside the house. Within 20 minutes, they emerged with their belongings and ran off somewhere without looking back. They were truly troublesome. They had the audacity to live off me without any gratitude and expected to continue doing so. They'd better live their lives in desperation from now on. I'm very sorry for the inconvenience. It's all fine now. I don't think those two will ever appear in this house again, so please rest assured. After seeing off the two, I apologized to the prospective buyer and the real estate agent and continued with the viewing. Two weeks later, I received a call. The sale of the house was officially finalized. Finally, I was able to sever ties with that house filled with nothing but bitter memories. Phew. I can finally relax. Just as I was thinking this, I received a call from Olive. Hi, long time no see. How have you been? Long time no see. Oh, about that house, it's been successfully sold. Really? That's great. We had a light conversation for a while, but then I started wondering what Arnold and Loretta were up to. By the way, what are those two doing now? Oh, they're living together in a cheap and dingy apartment. Arnold is still only working part-time at the grocery store. It seems like he's started to seriously look for a job, but at his age, it's tough to get hired. They're making so little that mom is also working a part-time job stocking shelves at the supermarket. Considering everything, getting a divorce might have been the right decision for you. Olive was right. If I had continued living with them, my burden would have only increased. Haha ha, lol that might be true lol I'd like to keep in touch with you, Olive. Is it okay if I call you occasionally? Really? That would be great. Please do. Let's go out for lunch sometime with my child. And with that, the phone call ended. I guess it suits me best to live my life alone, doing what I like. For now, I think I'll steer clear of marriage and relationships. Agriculture, huh? Sounds poor. Just completely mismatched with our family. My future mother-in-law said to me during a family meeting. I was well aware that my fiancé was the heir to a prestigious company. And I thought I understood what it meant to become his wife, 
how challenging it could be. But the words of my future mother-in-law were more cutting than I expected. She looked down upon my grandparents, who raised me, as mere country farmers. The arrogant future mother-in-law always stayed true to herself. This did not change even during the family meeting we had with my grandpa. However, Emily, haven't you realized? The shocking past revealed by my future father-in-law. Hearing this, the pride of my future mother-in-law was shattered. My life has been a whirlwind in the first half. Now as an adult, I sometimes feel that way. My name is Serena, I'm 27. As a child, after losing my parents one after the other, my grandparents raised me. My dad passed away from illness in my first year. And my mom suddenly disappeared in a car accident when I was in fourth grade. I somewhat understood my dad's death because others told me, but I fully comprehended my mom's. Perhaps due to the difference in my age, I had somehow moved on from my dad's death. But accepting my mom's took much longer. Supported by my grandparents, I believe I've overcome the sadness of being without my parents as I grew up. And they gave me unlimited love. To ensure I didn't struggle, they put me through college, always prioritizing me. I'm currently working as a professional in a company. In this industry-leading and long-established company, there are various people. But I never imagined I'd meet the president's son. Let alone date him. Serena, would you date me? Tyler was one of the employees seconded from a subsidiary to the head office. Only a few people in the company knew Tyler was the president's son. I didn't know until Tyler and I started dating and he confided in me. Dad said to work at the head office, but I wanted to see every part of the company for the future. Really? I believe in the necessity of starting from the bottom, even if it's not quite apprenticeship. Tyler and I participated in various projects together. He always worked more earnestly than anyone, taking on even the smallest tasks. When needed, he could lead and inspire the team. So kind, yet strong and dependable. Marry me! On our second anniversary. At the aquarium, our first date spot, Tyler knelt down and proposed to me. It was a classic proposal. I'd be honored. With happiness and a bit of shyness, I accepted his proposal. When I told my grandparents, they cried with joy. Serena is getting a family again. It's like gaining another grandchild. My grandparents were looking forward to meeting Tyler. Having the family grow seemed like their greatest joy. I lost my parents, but my grandparents had lost their child. Our home lost its liveliness, and all of us tried unconsciously not to be weighed down by sorrow. For our family, my marriage was a very bright topic. I planned to bring Tyler home to meet my grandparents soon, but first, we had a family meeting with Tyler's family. Tyler's parents' home is, in essence, the president's house. That alone made me nervous. Moreover, the house we visited was magnificent from the entrance, and the interior was spacious and beautiful. Nice to meet you. I'm Serena. Oh, so you're the one. Hmm, Serena, is it? Emily, my future mother-in-law, was cold from the beginning. Or rather, she had no intention of welcoming me in the first place. Emily is the president's wife. Going back in time, she was also a president's daughter. As Tyler told me, our company was originally founded by Emily's ancestors. And her grandfather and father had been presidents in succession. Tyler's dad, Kent, the current president, took over the company. I'll do my best too. But in our house, mom's dominance always prevails. Dad and I are overshadowed at home. Tyler had hinted at Emily's nature beforehand, but the real thing was more impact fell. Emily eloquently spoke about her family history. How she was raised in a distinguished family, maintaining her dignity. 
and how much effort she put into Tyler's education as a mother. Tyler attended the same elite school as me and our entire family. Yes. Not just yes, Serena. Do you understand what that means? Uh. Hey, Emily. Kent, be quiet. Shrugging off Kent's attempt to calm her, Emily glared at me. Do you understand the value of the school that Tyler and I attended, Serena? The kind of privileged people who should attend there? What do you think? Mom! Tyler also stood up, leaning towards Emily. But Emily, unfazed, turned her criticism towards Tyler. Tyler, you had such a wonderful environment and connections. How could you choose someone like her as a marriage partner? Hey, that's rude to Serena. Rude? Tyler, I'm disappointed. After everything we've given you. Enough about the house, the family, please. Yes, it's supposed to be a happy occasion. You all be quiet. What was supposed to be a meeting for the upcoming marriage turned into a family argument. I couldn't intervene, and in the end, Kent somehow managed to calm Emily down. On our way out, Kent desperately apologized to me. Um, it's okay. I'm sorry for troubling you today. No, it's not your fault. It's our fault. The disappointment I felt seemed less than the shock Tyler and Kent experienced. Kent approved of the marriage, but Emily only reluctantly accepted it not welcoming me. Whenever I joined family meals as a fiancé, Emily would sigh and express her discontent. Once, she asked about my family. I told her the truth, not hiding anything. How I lost my parents early and was raised by my grandparents. How we overcame sadness together, the three of us, supporting each other. How my grandparents worked hard in agriculture so I wouldn't have to struggle. I am nothing but grateful to my grandparents. I believe my parents are watching over us, but the love I received from my grandparents who were actually there for me. I still remember it strongly. I conveyed my feelings. The rest was up to how Emily felt about it. I hoped she would understand even a little, but I was naive. Agriculture, huh? Sounds poor just completely mismatched with our family. Mom! How could you say such a thing? That's right. Emily, how far will you go in belittling people? Belittle? I'm just telling the truth. Emily and Kent argued as they used to. Kent apologized to me while scolding Emily. But that wouldn't make Emily back down. The meal ended in a heavy atmosphere. Serena. If you're fed up, you can leave me. Marrying me means dealing with Emily. I can't cut ties with her because of the company. Think about it, while well, you still can. Hearing Emily mock my grandparents and seeing Tyler with such a tired, dark expression left me at a loss for words. But I managed to respond. It's okay. I feel sorry for grandpa and grandma, but I'm fine with this. Really? Tyler and I continued to encourage each other as we moved towards our marriage. I knew we had to meet with grandpa and grandma soon, but I wasn't looking forward to it. What should I do? As I thought about this on my way home, my face must have shown my distress. What's wrong? Why such a gloomy face? Did something happen with Tyler? Grandma saw right through me, and I had no choice but to open up about everything. I told them about Emily's personality and what she said about me and my grandparents, leaving them in silence. Well, I suppose we should meet them once. Let's have a dinner soon. Grandpa finally spoke up. He instructed me to arrange the time. But he insisted on a high-end restaurant. I was puzzled, but Grandpa just laughed. Don't worry, I'll pay for the meal. That's all Grandpa said in the end. On the day of the dinner, Grandpa arrived alone. 
Grandma, shocked by Emily's behavior, refused to meet her. Grandpa and I waited for Tyler and his parents, but Tyler messaged that he and Kent would be late. That meant Grandpa and I would have to deal with Emily first. Just the thought gave me a headache. As I held my head, Emily arrived, greeted us curtly, and sat down. She looked at me and Grandpa with a very displeased expression. You didn't have to match our family with a high-end restaurant. A lower-class place would have sufficed. No, no. It would be rude to meet for the first time in such a place. Oh, I made you worry. But I wonder how long you can keep this up. It's harsh to expect such standards from country farmers. Well, we prioritize living a healthy and honest life over money. Grandpa faced Emily calmly and firmly, without changing his attitude or behavior. Emily seemed displeased and spat out sarcastic comments and irritation towards Grandpa. Sorry for keeping you waiting. Tyler finally showed up. Kent followed him. Kent started to say something but stopped when he locked eyes with Grandpa. Ah. Hey, you too. Why apologize to these people? If we make them wait, that's how it should be treated. Hey, Emily. Kent's lips trembled, and his face turned pale with cold sweat. What now? Another opinion from you? No. Emily, don't you realize? Eh? As Tyler and I watched in surprise, Kent deeply bowed to Grandpa. Chairman, I deeply apologize for my wife's numerous rudeness. Please forgive us. No need, chairman is a title from the past. President, today's not about that. What? What is it? Quiet! It's not what? This man was once the chairman of a corporation that saved our company from a crisis. Huh? What? I didn't know that. Emily has always been a haughty lady. Kent remembered calling Grandpa chairman, but Grandpa had once managed several companies. By the time I was a child, he had become a farmer, and according to Grandma, he had wanted to retire early from being a businessman. I had no idea how significant a businessman Grandpa had been. But according to Kent, Grandpa was a wealthy and well-known chairman of a famous company. Back then, the company I worked for was on the brink of bankruptcy under Emily's father's presidency. With no hope for a loan from the bank, the company was saved by Grandpa's company, where he was the chairman and also a business partner. Emily turned pale and stiffened at Kent's words. Let's have a pleasant dinner today, as a start to our future relationship. With Grandpa's smile and words, the tense dinner began. We ate cheerfully, without showing any irritation. Tyler and Kent seemed a bit dazed, but occasionally smiled and chatted with Grandpa. Emily, however, kept her head down and barely moved her hands. The wedding preparations accelerated after the dinner. We set the wedding date and planned the ceremony and reception. Marrying a company heir was more challenging than I thought. Emily was completely left out of the loop. After making a big mistake at the dinner, she seemed to have lost all her usual boldness. She was restless and awkward around me. When asked for her opinion in wedding discussions, she just shook her head. It was unimaginable she would ever be as aggressive as before. Um, Emily. I have something to discuss. As I spoke, Emily tried to leave. Wait, please. I'd like your advice on the dress design, color, and venue decoration. It would be wrong for me to give my opinion. Emily looked down, feeling worthless. That's not true. You're familiar with dresses and know about glamorous things. That's no longer useful. No, it's important to me. I want to talk about such things with you, Emily. I can't with my mom anymore. I had given up on doing things with mom a long time ago. It was the path I had to live, 
and there was nothing I could do about it, even if I hated it. But deep down, I had always hoped for it. A wish I never shared with Grandpa and Grandma. I knew it would only trouble them. But I could confide in Emily. Even with everything that had happened, she would become mom when I married Tyler. I needed to face her properly first. I'm sorry. I never tried to understand your situation, Serena. Emily apologized with tears in her eyes. I silently nodded, taking her hand. Emily chose a beautiful red dress for me. Serena, a softer shade suits you better than a dark red. Emily, who knew about flowers, helped with the reception venue decoration. Tyler and Kent looked on happily as I, the planner, and Emily gathered together to discuss. I'm ready to live with my new family. Including my own life, I want to build happiness. Being called by my name just gets my heart racing. It's incredibly thrilling. In the dead of night, I stumbled upon Tanner and Rebecca, frolicking in the back seat of a car in the garage. Shocked by the unbelievable scene before me, I locked the two of them in the garage and headed back to my parents' house. I want to show those two, who've been making a fool of me, what real hell feels like. Back at my parents' house, I explained the situation to my parents and another person, asking for their cooperation in my revenge. Everyone agreed, and I resolved to make Tanner and Rebecca experience true hell. My name is Natasha. I'm a newlywed. I met my husband, Tanner, back in our student days. We were classmates in high school, worked together on committees, and had a few interactions. But that was the extent of our relationship. I never imagined that someone like him would approach me now, as adults. Natasha, I really do love you, he said. Our relationship began right after graduating high school. During our final cultural festival as seniors, Tanner started to get involved with me, and we began to interact as friends. Despite barely knowing each other, he started pursuing me relentlessly right after graduation. I couldn't understand why a guy who was so popular among girls during our school days would be interested in someone like me. Even when I asked him why, he would simply say he was smitten, never providing a concrete reason. Suspicious of his motives, I spent six months investigating, but couldn't find any convincing reasons and eventually, overwhelmed by his persistence, I accepted his proposal. If I just wanted to date and ditch someone, I wouldn't put in all this effort. Can't you trust me already? I truly love you, Natasha, he said. Hearing those words, I began to consider trusting him. But as a novice in love, it took a lot of courage for me to date someone as popular as him. That's when I turned to my older sister, Rebecca, for advice. Rebecca was beautiful and stylish, rumored to be among the most popular in school, as I heard from her classmates. I thought consulting with Rebecca, who had plenty of experience in love, would help me find the answer. When I talked to her about it, her encouragement felt like a gentle push forward. Just for dating, a playboy wouldn't spend six months. I really think Tanner is serious about you, Natasha. Why don't you accept it? Rebecca's words convinced me to start a relationship with Tanner. A year went by. In the beginning, Tanner was incredibly kind. He treated me like a princess. He took me to my favorite places, and every anniversary, birthday, and event was celebrated with a surprise making it feel like a dream. For someone inexperienced in love like me, all these felt like fairy tale moments, and I was thrilled to have taken the chance with him. Until the day we decided to get married. What's with this filthy room? I like things clean. You know what happens if you turn this place into a dump, right? After deciding to get married, we bought a new house. Tanner worked as a laborer in his father's company, earning around $40,000 a year. He didn't have the means to buy a house. Yet, disliking used things, Tanner insisted I stretch our finances to purchase a new home. Calling household management a hassle, he dumped all responsibilities on me, living freely himself. This is your house too, so I wish you'd help with the cleaning. I have a job too, so let's support each other, 
okay? You can at least tidy up, can't you? I work as a nurse with irregular shifts. Tanner actually spends more time at home and earns $30,000 less than I do. Despite the significant differences in time and money, he doesn't cooperate at all. I cover all household expenses, while Tanner only spends his salary on leisure and consumables. Before marriage, he spoke of mutual support and striving together. But after moving in, Tanner changed completely. He became a total freeloader. I once tried to get him to cook, but the taste and his knife skills were disastrous. The house ended up a mess, and I gave up on having him cook. If I let him do the laundry, he'd throw everything in together, causing shrinkage and color bleeding. He was far from trustworthy. Even Mary, my mother-in-law had concerns, but I never anticipated it being this bad until I saw it with my own eyes. You're the one who told me not to do housework, right? Now you're making it sound like it's my fault when you start getting called out? Initially, I patiently taught him household chores, but Tanner was short-tempered and prone to violence. Just mentioning household tasks triggered such reactions, and out of fear, I once said I'd handle everything myself to avoid his outbursts. But I'm only human. Nursing is many times harder than people think. My stamina has declined since my early 20s, making it tough to balance home life with work. And on top of that, the household chores have more than doubled compared to when I lived alone. I often wish I had extra hands. Is it so wrong to ask for help in such circumstances? Tanner becomes immediately enraged, showing his aggressive side whenever his sore spots are poked. Once, when I dared to stand up to him, he threw things against the wall and almost injured me. I've been scared of him and even considered divorce, but each time he would become uncharacteristically kind, showering me with love as if he were a different person. I'm sorry, Natasha. I'll never do this again. I truly value you. Please don't leave me. I genuinely love you. I can't live without you. Rarely feeling needed by others, I couldn't dismiss such affection from Tanner and saw no alternative but to forgive him. He was the first person I truly loved. I couldn't envision a life with good encounters after losing him. Such thoughts were reinforced by various things said by Rebecca and Tanner during our relationship. No one else would put up with someone like you, Natasha. If you leave Tanner, you might spend your life alone. At that time, I was completely dominated by the thought that no one but Tanner could love someone like me, a belief instilled by his manipulative words. Even when I thought about leaving, memories of our relationship and Tanner's need for me held me back. It's like the saying, the one who falls in love loses. I was completely ensnared by Tanner's manipulative tactics. I want to support you if I can, but housework is just not my thing. I'm counting on you for that. Please don't say such sad things. I'll try to do what I can. He probably noticed my fear after his outburst. As soon as he approached me, he embraced me and gently stroked my hair to calm me. Tanner was skilled at using both the carrot and the stick, always making me feel needed just when I thought all was lost. For someone shy and introverted like me, being needed and loved by someone was a way to affirm my existence. Tanner had great communication skills and was an observant person. He was adept at manipulating someone to the brink of life and death. I was frequently bullied during my school days, which affected my self-esteem. Tanner exploited this, convincing me he was the only one who needed me. He claimed to love and accept even my flaws. Little did I know at the time, this was all part of his manipulative tactics. To be honest, it never even crossed my mind. Until the day I witnessed that scene. As our first wedding anniversary approached, encouraged by my parents, we decided to have a wedding ceremony with Tanner. Rebecca had her wedding at a garden but where do you plan to have yours? Maybe a church wedding would be nice? The decision to have a ceremony was partly due to my parents' suggestion. Dad and Mom have always been deeply concerned about me. They know I'm the kind to care for others, sometimes at my own expense, readily sacrificing myself for the sake of others. When I became a nurse, 
They worried if I could truly handle it. You have a kind heart that tends to overdo things. Remember, it's not good to always put others first. Take care of yourself, too. Despite their worries, they were my biggest supporters when I decided to become a nurse. Dad's concern also came to the forefront when it came to my marriage. Usually not one to meddle, Dad for the first time wanted to have a serious talk with Tanner and invited him over. Natasha is our treasure. If anything happens to her, I'll never forgive you. Are you prepared to take care of her? Dad didn't hesitate to intimidate Tanner, who seemed nervous. But Tanner didn't flinch and insisted earnestly that he wanted to marry me. I also want a solemn atmosphere for the wedding, so maybe we should look for a church. I know I've been a burden to Natasha, so I want to make the main event especially wonderful for her. Lost in thought, Tanner's voice brought me back to reality. Seeing Tanner smile sheepishly made my heart race. I never imagined he thought that way. Partly because his words and his everyday actions are so different. I wish he would be more kind on regular days and not just on special occasions. If we could just eat together, watch movies in the living room and laugh, I'd be so happy. Why does Tanner have to say such awful things? Does he really love me? Does he really need me? Having little experience with relationships, I kept wondering if something was wrong with me. Maybe Tanner's lack of desire is because I'm lacking in some way. I must try harder. I convinced myself, suppressing any thoughts of confronting Tanner. Contrary to my feelings, Dad and Mom seemed impressed by Tanner's words, looking at him kindly. You're lucky, Natasha, to marry such a good man. My parents thought Tanner was a good husband. And at that time, so did I. It's true, Natasha is so lucky. She's not good at much besides housework. Are you sure you're not missing anything, Tanner? Rebecca, who happened to be there, sat next to Tanner without hesitation. She flirtatiously placed her hand on Tanner's knee and looked up at him. No. That's not true at all. Rebecca is the opposite of me, sociable and beautiful. She's always fashionable and brand conscious. And thanks to her husband who runs an IT company, she lives a lavish lifestyle. Rebecca often looked down on me, belittling me to elevate herself. But she too was adept at getting her way, manipulating me skillfully. Back then, I didn't realize I was being used by Rebecca. I felt happy to be relied on and pampered. Is that so, Natasha, you two shouldn't let go of such a good man so easily either. After all, you're just a burden with no redeeming qualities. Rebecca! Such mockery was a routine occurrence. She used her pretty face and tears as weapons, pushing people away from me. Everyone seemed to side with Rebecca. The only exception was my parents. Mom always scolds Rebecca sharply whenever she mocks me. Seeing no way to turn the situation in her favor, Rebecca quickly leaves the scene, but the pain in my heart lingers. What was a joyful moment is ruined by Rebecca's words. Tanner, along with Dad and Mom, apologizes, but he just laughs it off, saying it's nothing. Deep down, I wish for some comforting words, but I don't have the courage to ask for such audacity. It's my fault, as always, I tell myself, accustomed to resolving things on my own. Time passed and it was now the day before the wedding. The ceremony was set to be held at a church, and today, Rebecca was visiting my house. She said it was closer to the venue from our place. Let's call it a night since it's early tomorrow. I'm borrowing your bed. After having dinner and a shower, we enjoyed some drinks. It was past 10 p.m., and we were all feeling the effects, so we decided to get some sleep. I would share the bed with Tanner, and Rebecca would sleep in my room. Around midnight, with the feeling of warmth vanish from the futon, the chills woke me up. Tanner? It was still autumn, a bit chilly for a nighttime stroll. Maybe he went to the grocery store without saying anything? It was unusual for Tanner to leave like that, so I decided to look around, starting with checking the car in the garage. That's when I heard it. No, Tanner. It sounded like Rebecca's voice coming from the direction of the car. Tanner's car was there, not looking like he went to the grocery store. 
thinking Tanner might be nearby since Rebecca called his name, I walked towards the sound. Being called by my name just gets my heart racing. It's incredibly thrilling. I spotted the two in the back seat, engaged in something. Just as I was about to approach and call out, I witnessed an unbelievable scene. Rebecca, can you keep your voice down? It's impossible, Tanner, be gentler with me. The two of them were naked, embracing, caught in the midst of intimacy. Shocked and wordless, I collapsed on the spot. They didn't notice me, completely absorbed in each other. Maybe it was too hot with the windows up, or they needed some fresh air, but the car windows were open. Because of that, Rebecca's sugary voice and Tanner's animal-like breaths were audible. The disturbing sounds filled me with discomfort and nausea, and I crouched down, trying to hold back vomit. What's happening? What are Rebecca and Tanner doing? Is this a dream? Am I having a nightmare? Unable to believe the scene before me, I kept trying to escape reality. Oblivious to my presence, the two continued their act, engrossed in each other. Tanner's desire for Rebecca, something I've never experienced, painfully tore at my heart. And then, from the two of them, I heard words even more horrifying. It's like a dream, to be connected with you like this. You really love me, don't you? You did tell me before that you've admired me since our school days. Rebecca's words, revealing a shocking truth, left me stunned and confused. Were Tanner and Rebecca acquainted since their school days? But how could Tanner have known Rebecca? When I saw you at the cultural festival, you were just too dazzling. I used Natasha to get close to you. When I heard you were married, I couldn't hide my shock. Tanner's words brought back a memory. On the day of the high school festival, Rebecca, who was hunting for boys, visited my class's booth. There, as I played the role of a waitress in a cafe, being teased and mocked by Rebecca, Tanner had fallen for her at first sight. Learning that Tanner had targeted me for use since those days brought tears welling up in my eyes. But now, I'm connected with you like this. When you approached me, it felt like a dream. And to suggest something so wicked, you really are someone not to be underestimated. Hearing this, my astonishment was apparent. Their relationship started with Rebecca seducing Tanner, who knew he had feelings for her. To be with the married Rebecca, Tanner had to marry me, become part of the family, and not arouse suspicion. Rebecca's husband, Scott, often traveled for work and was rarely at home. Becoming relatives with Rebecca, who was nearly free, meant their relationship would raise fewer suspicions. They reflected on the past, discussing their actions. Hearing this unbelievable truth, I quietly moved away from the scene. Unable to contain my tears, I ran to the entrance, weeping, and collapsed once I closed the door. I can't believe that they had been using me all along. And how they thought of me in such a way. It was unforgivable, absolutely unforgivable. Love turned into rage and hatred, and I, holding the keys, headed to the garage where the two of them were. The garage was secured with a shutter, and the entrance was the only way in or out. By the time I returned, both were exhausted, quietly sleeping in the back seat. Perhaps they never thought I would find out. With a sigh at their foolish actions, I slowly closed the shutter and locked it. Then, I headed to my parents' house, not far from here, and poured my heart out to Dad and Mom. What's wrong, Natasha? At this hour? And your clothes? Arriving in my pajamas, Dad was taken aback with his eyes wide. Mom, concerned, immediately let me into the house. Both were somehow awake, which made me wonder. It was unusual for them, with their regular lives, to be up at this time. Had something happened? With that question in mind, I stepped inside, only to find Scott, of all people, sitting on the sofa. Good evening, Natasha. What's going on? Why are you dressed like that? Did something happen? Scott was indeed sincere and a gentleman. Too good for Rebecca, he too must have been deceived into marrying her. As I hesitated about whether to share the day's events, Scott seemed to sense something and spoke up. Did you hear it too? Scott asked. At that moment, my eyes widened in shock. Hear what? 
this. Scott said, pulling out a recording device. The voices I heard from it left me speechless. So bold to suggest something so wicked, you really are not to be underestimated. It was a recording of the very conversation I had overheard between Tanner and Rebecca. How do you have this? My voice rose in surprise, and I was visibly shaken. Scott, looking uncomfortable, started explaining. Rebecca had been reckless with money and men. He found out three months ago when someone from his company reported seeing Tanner and Rebecca entering a hotel. After discovering the affair, Scott hired a private investigator to gather evidence of their infidelity. Today, knowing Rebecca was visiting my house, the investigator intensely monitored her, capturing this recording. At first, I thought if money could make up for my absence and make Rebecca happy, I'd stay out of it. But when Tanner got involved, it was a different story. I couldn't stand it, knowing how much you cared for him. Scott had always cared for me like a real big brother. And he couldn't bear to see me hurt because of them. Just knowing how he cared was a relief to my heart. I was collecting evidence against Rebecca to confront her for a divorce. I got the decisive evidence today and came to discuss it with your parents. Turning to dad and mom, I saw them looking distressed. Dad was even apologizing profoundly to Scott. I'm sorry. For Rebecca to do such a thing. We're deeply ashamed as parents. We know an apology won't make up for it. Please, do whatever you feel is necessary to find peace. Watching mom cry and apologize, my heart ached. Please, lift your heads. It's not your fault. Those who used Natasha and committed these acts are the ones to blame. Though Scott must be hurting too, he remained composed and comforted my parents. After calming them down, he turned to me. Natasha, what are your wishes? I'm fine as long as I can sever ties with Rebecca. But you, you must want more than that. Yes. My wife seduced your husband. I bear some responsibility. I want to support you fully, so you can find closure. Empowered by his resolute gaze, I declared my desire for revenge. I want to show those two who belittled me what true hell feels like. Overwhelmed with anger and frustration, I let my tears flow freely. Looking up at Scott, I voiced my true feelings for the first time. I want them to taste despair. Leave the financial aspect to me. I'll do everything I can. What do you want to do with those two? Hearing Scott's words, I candidly voiced a plan that had come to mind. I have to say I was surprised at how quickly such a daunting idea had occurred to me. Scott, Dad, and Mom all agreed to cooperate upon hearing it. And so, our family's revenge plan commenced. Natasha! What were you thinking? How dare you lock us up like that? Two days later, Tanner and Rebecca, finally escaping from the shutter, showed up at my parents' house. They were still in the same clothes from three days ago, likely not having showered. Their clothes were wrinkled and faintly sour-smelling. Rebecca's makeup was ruined, her face and attire a mess. Who do you think is responsible for being locked up like that? I calmly responded at the entrance. But my response seemed to infuriate them even more. Shut up! You think you can talk down to me like that, huh? How could you lock us up and leave us for two days? If it weren't for the service guy, who knows what could have happened to us? When we went back home, we found strangers and they showed us some contract and told it wasn't our house anymore. What's going on, explain yourself. The truth was, with Scott's help, that garage was set to be demolished. Since the house also belonged to me, while they were locked up, I moved all the essentials to our family home. The house is now being rented out to an acquaintance. It was designed considering eventual cohabitation with our parents, so it found a tenant quickly due to its excellent accessibility. Tanner's belongings were haphazardly packed into bags and sent to his parents' house. With the people Scott brought in, the work was done swiftly and efficiently. The noise and the stink, give me a break. Just hearing those screams in the morning is enough to stress me out. 
I grimaced in disgust at their state. Tanner, unable to tolerate my expression, lunged at me. But Scott appeared and grabbed his arm, protecting me. Scott! You two really are despicable. A man who dares to raise his hand against a woman. What kind of character do you have? Aren't you ashamed? Why is Scott here, and even Mom and Dad? It's our family home, so naturally, Dad and Mom would be there. But what truly shocked Rebecca wasn't that. Everyone who used to dote on her now stood behind me, protecting me. She couldn't understand why no one was trying to help her. Don't you realize the situation you're in? What did you say? As Tanner shook off the restraining hand and scowled. Scott played the recording from the other day. What? We were being bugged. But how, where? They didn't have any wearable devices or mobile phones on them, so it seemed impossible that they were bugged. While they were confused, Scott smirked mischievously. I've been aware of your affairs for a while now. That's why I hired an investigator to gather decisive evidence of your infidelity. Upon hearing Scott's words, Rebecca's face turned pale. She thought her affairs had gone unnoticed, never imagining she was under investigation. Overwhelmed by the professionalism of the investigators, Rebecca was speechless, as if engulfed in darkness. Never thought you'd provide such conclusive evidence. I was so surprised, I laughed, Scott said. That's a crime. Yeah. If we report this to the police. Do you two have any evidence of that? Scott countered. Their attempts to intimidate Scott were futile. His firm stance showing no fear and words sounding like he was about to hunt them down caused Tanner and Rebecca to falter. If you two, who are financially inferior to me, want to hire a lawyer and go to court, I'm more than ready. If I say I just happened to encounter you and recorded it, it doesn't prove I hired an investigator. If you want to challenge me, gather evidence that could defeat me first. Indeed, a savvy businessperson. His quick thinking is extraordinary. The two, unable to respond, switched their target to me. What about you locking us up? That's a serious crime. Do you have proof? What? Stunned by the question, Tanner was at a loss for words. Now it was my turn to corner them. There's no evidence that I locked you up, but there's proof of your affair on the garage's security cameras. I bet they captured some unsightly footage of you two getting into the car and doing indecent things. Hearing this, the color drained from their faces, and they began to back away in fear. I believed your words for years, thinking you truly cared for me. But it was all an act, just to connect with Rebecca and cheat on me. No, it's not like that. Natasha, please forgive me. I really love and no one else. Me too. What happened with Tanner was just a momentary lapse, nothing serious. I swear it's true. Please believe me, forgive me, Scott. Realizing their disadvantage, the two abruptly changed their tone and started apologizing. They were clinging to our feet, weeping and pleading for forgiveness in their disgraceful state. Let go. What? I said let go. I yelled at Tanner, and Scott shook Rebecca off. Why would anyone forgive you too? No matter what happens, I will never forgive you. No matter how much you apologize or beg, I will never forgive you. Rot in hell with your regrets. With an anger never shown before, the two were thoroughly intimidated and fled the house. Dad and Mom, who had been watching worriedly, came to comfort me, and Scott gently stroked my hair, saying I did well. At that moment, overwhelmed with relief, I broke down in tears. The harrowing days I endured felt like hell itself. Clinging to memories, I tried to endure, but I was reaching my limit. Before breaking down, I managed to end that life, and the feeling of liberation made my emotions erupt. Thus, I successfully executed my revenge on Rebecca and Tanner. They fled to Tanner's parents' house, but as I had already explained the situation, they were denied entry and turned away. Moreover, due to their misconduct, John, my father-in-law refused to employ him any longer. 
Tanner was already problematic at the company, so it didn't take long for him to be disowned, as I learned later. Rebecca and Scott soon divorced. Despite Rebecca's pleas until the end, she lacked the financial means to contest the divorce settlement and had no choice but to accept Scott's terms. Naturally, Tanner and Rebecca were charged a significant sum for compensation, considering the cancellation of the wedding and all the preparations that were ruined. Thanks to Scott hiring an excellent lawyer, we managed to make the two sign an agreement ensuring they'd pay up, and now they are both working desperately to fulfill it. I explained the situation to everyone who was supposed to attend the wedding. They were all disillusioned but supportive, offering understanding and assistance. I also made sure to explain the situation to the neighbors when the two were locked in the shutter for two days. I didn't want any commotion or the police getting involved, which would jeopardize the plan. Being well liked by the neighbors and Rebecca being known as the unpleasant sister who always looked down on me, everyone sided with me. As a result, Tanner and Rebecca are now viewed coldly by everyone. Once living a lavish life, they now lead a life of poverty, struggling daily, considerably thinner, as I've heard from friends. For years have passed since the incident. I'm devoted to my work, and Scott is also busy with his own. Dad and Mom are living fulfilling days, supporting my life and career. They even encourage me to find happiness when I meet the right person, motivating me to look forward. Hoping to make them proud, I'm also investing in self-improvement. I got pregnant. Don't come back home. What? Was I not clear? I'm having a baby with Johnny. No, no. No way. Pearl, it's your fault. You neglected your husband under the guise of accompanying your mother, so you got what you deserved. Mila said this with a triumphant look. But I, without any disturbance, took the message don't come back quite literally. Really? I'd be delighted to. Johnny and Mila were dumbstruck by my unexpected reaction. Pearl. What are you saying? Aren't you angry that I cheated? Well, I was surprised at first, but not angry. Besides, I have a new home now. New home? What's that about? Yes, I have somewhere else to go. I don't need to bother with Johnny, whom I can't trust anymore. Mila can have him. I muttered that to myself. And these two were about to face an incredible disaster. I am Pearl, a 43-year-old working mother in construction. I have had a best friend from childhood, Mila. We've been hanging out since we were little. But in middle school, we became like delinquent friends due to our rebellious natures. That continued until high school graduation, but as we grew up, our lives took completely different paths. I have always hated studying, so instead I worked on self-improvement in my 20s, such as earning certifications. My efforts paid off, and my career got on the right track in my 30s. On the other hand, Mila spent her 20s and 30s partying, believing it is a waste not to. Now past 40, both unmarried. Mila didn't seem too concerned. But I, raised by a single mother after losing my father young, wanted to get married and repay my mother's upbringing. At work, most men close to my age were married. I casually asked my boss if he knew any eligible men. He introduced me to a single man close to my age. That's how I met Johnny. He was two years older than me, a construction company president. Serious and dignified. Johnny, who inherited the company from his parents, was work-focused like me. Busy with work and acquiring certifications, he hadn't been much interested in marriage. We clicked over having a lot in common so we started dating. Within a year, we promised to marry. I told Mila the news. Really? That's great, Pearl. Congratulations. Thanks. Sorry I'm getting married before you. Don't worry about it. Just be happy. Mila seemed genuinely happy for me. Thank you. You must come to the wedding. Sure. I'll look forward to it. After informing Mila, all that was left was preparing for the wedding. Tomorrow, I'm visiting Johnny's family home for the first time. 
I was in a flutter of excitement. But I didn't know that the happiness would end in a blink of an eye. The next morning. I was getting ready with enthusiasm. What would Johnny's house be like? Though it's his family home, his parents have passed away. It's where Johnny now lives alone. I've always wanted to see his house. But he never invited me. It's quite far from my house, near the foot of a mountain. I planned to drive there, but Johnny offered to pick me up as the house was hard to find. Johnny said shyly while driving. Well, it's quite rural, so don't be shocked. No, I prefer quiet places to busy ones. Is it peaceful countryside? I'm really excited. I tried to lighten the mood, however. Hmm. Johnny looked hesitant. It seemed like he wanted to imply don't expect too much. But to me, it's where my beloved one lives. The thought of seeing that was exciting. We drove over an hour after entering the neighboring town. We entered a dark bamboo grove, far from a peaceful pastoral scene. The car stopped in a place that felt like a creepy, abandoned area. We're here. This is my house. Johnny said, and where he dropped me off was a garage surrounded by debris. In front of me was an old house, probably over a hundred years old. Um, so this is your? Yes, this is my house. It's quite old, but it's well built. Johnny replied. I stood gaping, looking around every corner of the house. The property was large, but I naively thought that after marriage he would move out. However, Johnny's next words shocked me. Well, come on in. This is the house we'll live in together forever, so don't be shy. What? Living in this house forever after marriage. I asked Johnny feeling faint. Um, are we going to live here? It's nearly two hours by car from my office. Eh? Pearl, you can quit your job after we're married. My earnings are enough for us to live on. I was stunned by Johnny's unexpected words. We had discussed our jobs, but he never mentioned wanting me to quit after marriage. Why? I told you I love my job. Why decide I should quit without discussing it with me? Even when I questioned him, Johnny looked puzzled and answered. Isn't it common sense for a woman to become a housewife after marrying a well-off husband? My mother did the same. I thought we had a mutual understanding without saying. I stood there, dumbfounded. I hadn't expected such an old-fashioned mindset in this day and age. From here, not only my company, but also my mother's house was far away. I currently live with my mother, and moving so far would be inconvenient. I was planning to discuss these things, but my mind went blank and I couldn't find the words. The house, indeed old and sturdy, had crumbling walls in places, and the floors creaked. The shower and toilet were outdated, and with few rooms, it would be inconvenient if we had children. Could I really live in this house forever? Seeing my anxious face, Johnny tried to calm me. Don't worry. It might take some getting used to at first, but the charm of an old, antique house is great. You'll find it comfortable soon. No, that's not the issue. I wanted to say, but couldn't. For now, I decided not to say anything and asked him to take me home before it gets too late. You should stay over, it's far. Johnny casually said, but I was not in the mood to stay. That night, I lay in bed early and thought. Right, we might start in Johnny's family home, but we can move eventually. I've been working all this time and have some savings. Surely Johnny can afford to build a new home. I decided to discuss this with him next time. On my next day off, I talked to Johnny about moving into a new house. But he didn't seem keen on the idea. Why? It's a waste to move when we already have a house. Johnny said, already set on living in his own home. Am I being selfish for caring about convenience to my workplace and family home? I felt a rising irritation. Yet, I didn't dislike Johnny, and we got married as planned. The wedding was grand, befitting a construction company owner. Mila attended, of course. Flashy and youthful-looking Mila stood out, attracting male attention. Even Johnny the groom. That beautiful woman is Pearl's friend? 
he asked. I felt a twinge of jealousy, despite being the bride. The wedding ended without a hitch, and our married life began. Johnny lived leisurely in his familiar home. I resigned from my job and became a housewife, but felt somewhat uneasy. So, I hatched a plan. Then one day. I received a call from the hospital where my mother was a patient. She had suddenly fallen ill and was hospitalized. I rushed to the hospital and entered the room where my mother is in. Mom, are you okay? Pearl, sorry for worrying you. My mother replied, looking very unwell. According to the doctor, her condition wasn't good and she needed a long-term hospital stay. I returned home to take care of my mother for a while. Then, I packed my things and told Johnny that I'd be away for some time to accompany my mother. But Johnny didn't seem too concerned about her. Ah, uh, I see. Well, take your time. He said casually. I frowned at Johnny's reaction. It sounded as if I was going out for fun, despite me saying I was attending to my seriously ill mother. Yet, Johnny looked displeased at my expression. Huh? What's with that face? Did I say something wrong? No, it's nothing. I replied. Come to think of it, Johnny was raised in a wealthy environment. Expecting him to understand was perhaps too much. So, I left without saying more and went back to the hospital. Three months have almost passed since my mother was hospitalized. Her condition remains the same, requiring my constant attendance. But what bothers me is Johnny hasn't visited even once. Is he still holding a grudge because I frowned at his words? If so, that's rather childish. Lying in her bed, my mother looked at me worriedly. Pearl, is Johnny all right? Don't worry about me, why don't you go back home? It's okay, mom. I do go home occasionally. I reassured her, not wanting to worry her further, but truthfully, I felt anxious. For the first month, I did check on the house. But Johnny was always in a bad mood and hardly spoke to me. I would just finish the housework and return to the hospital. Gradually, I started feeling like Johnny was managing on his own, and I wasn't needed. Alone at night, as my mother slept, I wondered. Is this how things should be? Months passed with me lost in these thoughts, when I received a call. It was Mila. Hello? Pearl, it's been a while. Just thought of you and called. Mila, really long time. How have you been? Her voice uplifted my spirits. But something in Mila's reply seemed hesitant. Ah, uh, yeah. I'm fine. Oh, okay. I felt the conversation turn awkward, beginning to feel unsure of what to talk about next. Then, Mila broached a new topic. Hey, when are you coming back home next? What? I hadn't told Mila I was staying away to be with my mother. Her question took me by surprise. But since she reached out after so long, I recovered myself and asked her back. What's up, Mila? Did you call for something specific? Eh? No, nothing. Just wanted to hear your voice. As Mila spoke. Hey, Mila! A familiar male voice called out in the background. Mila gasped. Oh. And hurriedly ended the call. That voice. Could it be? A chill ran down my spine. It's been over three months since I stopped returning home. A bad feeling crept over me, and I decided to go home the next day. And the next day. After the morning rounds at the hospital, I hurried to my house. It was Sunday, so Johnny should be home. When I arrived, a bright red sports car occupied my usual parking space in the garage. That car seemed familiar. Entering the house, I saw stylish high heels in the entrance. I was right about my suspicion. Johnny! Are you here? I shouted from the entrance, and Johnny emerged, looking surprised. Pearl! Why are you back suddenly? You should have told me you were coming. Why? These shoes and the car in the garage, they're Mila's, aren't they? Yeah, um... Mila just happened to stop by. Johnny stammered, clearly flustered. 
Then, Mila appeared, dressed in a baggy overalls dress. Idiot! Don't come out! Johnny scolded her, but Mila didn't seem to care. Why? It's not like it's a secret. We had to talk about it eventually. She said defiantly. Mila stood there boldly, not showing any remorse. Her outfit was unusually simple for her, a long dress covering her ankles. It looked almost like a maternity dress. As I pondered, Mila revealed a shocking truth. I got pregnant. Don't come back home. What? Did you not hear me? I'm pregnant with Johnny's baby. She exclaimed. No way, really. Standing aside, Mila blurted out while Johnny, with a sigh. Just great. Kept his gaze downcast. Perhaps Johnny wished to have this conversation in a more composed state. Pearl, it's your fault. You were neglecting your husband under the guise of accompanying your mother. You brought this on yourself. Mila said this with a triumphant look. But I remained calm and collected. Seeing my calm demeanor, Mila said with puffing up her cheeks. What's with the act? I heard you don't even like this house. That's fine by me. Old as it may be, the property's spacious, the neighbors aren't nosy, and above all, Johnny's kind and wealthy. What more could I ask for? Johnny, buoyed by her high opinion of him, suddenly changed his awkward expression. When I first saw Mila at the wedding, it was love at first sight. So I figured, why not live with Mila instead of Pearl, who doesn't even like this house? That's right, Johnny called me after finding my contact in the guest list saying Pearl isn't coming back, so please, come over. I was unsure at first, but how could I say no when he needed me so much? Ah, uh, I see. I responded indifferently to Mila's smug love story. Hmm. Just playing cool, aren't you? You must be so upset. But let me remind you, Johnny's baby is growing inside me. Don't bother coming back here. With that, I decided to graciously accept her invitation with a smile. Really? I'd be delighted to. My unexpected reaction left Johnny and Mila dumbfounded. Pearl, what are you saying? Aren't you angry about my affair? Well, I was surprised at first, but not angry. Besides, I have a new home now. A new home? What are you talking about? Johnny looked utterly bewildered, so I gave him further explanation. You see, I've been house hunting since we got married. This house was fine initially, but it's not practical for children. There are no schools nearby. Mila looked startled by my words. She hadn't considered schooling for her unborn child. Why didn't you discuss this with me? Because you didn't want to move from here. So, I took it upon myself to find something. But that's no longer your concern. What do you mean? Johnny can be so oblivious. He had an affair and even got her pregnant. There's no way we'd be moving together now. I mean, you should stay here with Mila and your baby. You're well off, so just enroll your child in a distant school and drive them back and forth. As I spoke, Johnny nodded. Right, right. In agreement. Mila, wide-eyed, finally addressed me. Pearl, you're oddly compliant. How can you so easily accept Johnny and me? No, I've just lost faith in Johnny, who never once visited my seriously ill mother in the hospital. I've decided to live with her in the new house. We've arranged for home nursing care. Are you really not angry about the affair? You won't demand compensation later? Johnny is always so self-centered. The epitome of a coddled upbringing. Don't worry. I'm not that petty. I replied with a slight smile. I knew they would face their own karma eventually. And so, Johnny and I divorced. I moved into the new house with my mother. It's barrier-free designed, so she can recover comfortably. It's also close to the hospital, which gives me peace of mind. As for Johnny, he began his married life with Mila in that house. Mila's belly was getting bigger, but there was no hospital nearby. So, for checkups, Johnny apparently had to drive for over an hour to take her. Even then, 
they might have been able to have a happy married life. After a while, I got a call from Johnny. Hey! Why do we have to leave our house? I thought the day had finally come. Did your uncle visit? Yeah, he did. Did you know and hide it from me? Johnny's uncle is his father's brother. Huh? You should have known. That our house is owned by your uncle. Oh. It seemed Johnny had forgotten that and continued living in that house. I learned this when I visited Johnny's relatives before our marriage. When Johnny's father, the eldest son was dying, he entrusted the ownership of the family home to his younger brother, the uncle. It seems they thought Johnny was too unreliable to inherit it, even though he was the successor. In other words, Johnny was living there with his uncle's permission. I totally forgot about that. But yesterday, my uncle suddenly came and said, I believe I told my wife that I was selling this land. Why did you keep such an important thing a secret? Hearing this, I think your uncle is quite the actor. I couldn't help but to laugh inwardly. I had told the uncle everything up to our divorce. He was furious and promised to give Johnny a hard time. I'm sorry. I was about to tell you about selling the house, but then you got Mila pregnant. I thought it would be best to leave the rest to you too. But it's okay. You have enough money to move anywhere, right? Yeah, about that. Johnny's voice suddenly turned gloomy. I knew what he was going to say, but pretended not to know. What happened? I got demoted from being the president. My uncle said I was too unreliable and the employees wouldn't follow me. He told me to start over as a regular employee. So my salary is less than half now. Oh, really? I responded nonchalantly, but I already knew all this from Johnny's uncle. Mila is angry. She wanted to remodel and expand the house into a spacious mansion on the land we lived in. After hearing about moving and the salary cut, she hasn't spoken to me since last night. What should I do? Johnny sounded almost tearful. Mila was indeed after Johnny for his money. Well, that's not my problem anymore. You should figure it out yourself. What? No, wait! Johnny tried to stop me, but I didn't care and hung up. The next moment, Mila called. I didn't want to answer, knowing what it was about, but she would probably keep calling if I ignored her. So I reluctantly answered. Mila's voice was furious. Hey! What are you going to do about this? It's all your fault, Pearl. I thought I had married a rich man. Mila spat out the words I expected. Well, it's not so bad. Johnny is a kind husband to you. And it's not like he is unemployed. That's not good enough. You knew, didn't you? That we had to move out. And you kept quiet, that's so unfair. What if I had told you earlier? If the ideal life for you became impossible, you would have left. That would be sad for the baby. Mila had no comeback to that. Whatever life you lead, you're going to have a family now. You need to do your best. I said just that and hung up again. I had no resentment left for losing Johnny. I just realized I had a poor judgment of men. Forced to move, Johnny and Mila apparently moved into Mila's parents' house. Though her parents were angry about Mila marrying Johnny, who took me away, they warmly welcomed them for the sake of their coming grandchild. Then, years later, Johnny and Mila, with their child, came to see me. I hadn't told them where I moved, but they had seen me in town and followed me to find out where I lived. I wondered why they went to such lengths. Pearl, are you there? Actually, I came by because my child's kindergarten entrance exam results were announced today, and we were in the area. Mila barged into my house with her affected tone. Even as a mother now, she still sports flashy makeup and fashion. I didn't really want to see her, but fearing what she might say if I acted coldly, I responded. You haven't changed. So? How did it go? I wasn't interested in Mila, but knowing she'd start something anyway, I asked. Listen to this. 
my child got into the best kindergarten in the area. Ah, so you came all this way to tell me that? Well, congratulations. She clearly came to boast. That's right. My child takes after the father in intelligence and, thanks to resembling me, made a great impression at the interview. Mila droned on with her bragging. Oh, is that so? Good for you. I replied sarcastically, to which Mila, disliking my tone, glared at me. Despite someone's doing, we're happily living as a family now. Having a marriage and a family is wonderful, isn't it, Johnny? Uh, yeah, that's right. Johnny, who had been silent behind Mila, finally spoke up. Their son, indeed resembling Mila, glared at me with a proud expression. He seemed to have inherited Mila's high pride too. Speaking of the top kindergarten. Ha ha ha. Single woman like you wouldn't know about kindergartens, right? It's Nakatani Kindergarten nearby. Mila scoffed at me, so I quickly retorted. What? Who's single? I'm remarried. At this, both Johnny and Mila looked shocked. You're kidding, right? Isn't this your childhood home with your mother? Yes. I have my husband living here with me. As I said this, my husband Barrett appeared. Guests? Please, come in. Ah. Uh, you are. Seeing Barrett, the two of them exclaimed in surprise. Recognizing them, Barrett responded in a reminiscent tone. Ah, you must be Christie's parents from the other day's interview. The, the interviewer, was it? Yes, sorry for the late introduction. I'm Barrett, principal of Nakatani Kindergarten. Are you friends of Pearl? Thank you for your support on behalf of my wife. Hearing Barrett was the principal, they froze. Wait, the principal is Pearl's husband? Indeed. Who would have thought someone like you would marry the principal of a prestigious private kindergarten? How did you meet? Mila sneered at me. Unlike the old days, I've worked hard on myself. A woman like me. I didn't deserve to be mocked by Mila now. We met at work. My company was contracted for the kindergarten's reconstruction. Yes, I was attracted to her hard work, so I initiated our relationship. Barrett said with a shy smile. Oh, that's right. Barrett, let me introduce them. This is my ex-husband, Johnny, and his wife, Mila, who took him from me. You're making us look bad. That's right. What are you saying in front of the child? Both were flustered, facing the principal of their child's soon-to-be kindergartner. It's a prestigious kindergarten with strict family backgrounds. Knowing their complicated family circumstances might be a problem. Mila timidly asked Barrett. Uh, so, about the enrollment. Barrett's expression turned stern for a moment but then softened. Let's see how your child does in our environment first. So, our child can enroll? Johnny and Mila looked relieved. However, they didn't realize how challenging life in the kindergarten could be. Life at the kindergarten turned out to be a disaster for Johnny and Mila. Because in our school, parent connections are strong. Even a hint of bad reputation spreads quickly. So, the rumor that Mila stole the principal's wife's ex-husband spread like wildfire. Since it's a gathering of parents who are serious about their children's education, such rumors quickly isolated Johnny and Mila among the other parents. The parents' behavior negatively impacted the children. Innocent Christy ended up isolated from his friends, crying every day. I want to quit kindergarten. It was sad to see. Eventually, they had to leave the kindergarten, and Johnny's family disappeared from our lives. Later, Barrett heard from another kindergarten principal. Johnny's family had moved Christy to a public kindergarten. However, with many locals there, similar rumors spread. Johnny and Mila gradually found it uncomfortable to stay in the area. Before long, they left Christy behind and went somewhere far away. Recently, Mila's parents have been taking Christy to and from kindergarten and attending events. They're friendly with the neighbors, ensuring Christy can attend kindergarten comfortably, mindful of others. Previously indulgent, Mila's parents seem to have given up on Mila, 
focusing on raising Christy instead. I was worried about Christy, but hearing this from Barrett, I felt relieved. Some time later, Mila's parents came to apologize for everything. We're truly sorry for the late apology. We wanted to bring Mila, but she absolutely refused. Is Mila at home? I was surprised, having heard Johnny and his wife were missing. According to her parents, Johnny and Mila got divorced being unable to cope with poverty. Mila returned home alone. But Christy doesn't see her as a mother and ignores her at home. Time passed, and I gave birth to my first child, a daughter, at a local hospital. I made many mom friends. Though I lost a childhood friend, I look forward to spending time with moms in similar situations. Barrett took paternity leave and is being a supportive father. This might be my happiest time. No, I shall continue enjoying parenthood, blessed with a good family and friends. Like my mother, a single mom, I want to shower my daughter with love. Even if I once went in the wrong direction, I'll trust my daughter, family, friends, and more importantly in myself. I vow to live strongly as a mother. You always look beautiful. Today, too. You're nothing like my wife. I wish I could marry you soon. It was in the middle of the night when I woke up to go to the bathroom. I heard a surprising conversation from the living room. I'd also prefer a beautiful mom. I'd be happy that it could happen. Apparently, my husband and son were on a video call with someone. From the conversation, it seemed likely that it was my husband's mistress, and shockingly, my son was also talking with the woman. What in the world is going on? After all the times they've ignored me, to do something like this. For the past month, I've been treated as if I didn't exist by the two of them. Ignored completely, even when I spoke right in front of them, and on top of that, the meals I cooked were thrown in the trash. I felt my heart turning cold. And so, I vowed to get my revenge. My name is Lucy, a 39-year-old housewife. My husband Albert is a 45-year-old office worker, and our son Frederick is a 14-year-old middle school student. Our family was just an ordinary, average one, living happily together. Albert had an average income for his age and a normal look. But he was a very kind man. Our son, in the eighth grade, was in his rebellious phase, not listening to me, but I still adored him as my sweet boy. I worked hard as a housewife, doing everything all I could to support our family. However, our peaceful happiness shattered suddenly one day. It all started a month ago. Frederick, dinner's ready. One evening, I called out to my son, but he completely ignored me. Well, it's just a teenage behavior, I thought. At that time, I didn't care much. I'll leave them there in plastic wrap. I just said that and left it alone. But, I noticed something was off when my husband came home. Welcome back. Dinner's ready. I called out my husband, but he also ignored me. Then, my son came out of his room, running up to my husband. Dad, welcome back. Did you buy dinner? Yeah, your favorite burgers. Awesome. Meat's the best, right? Then, my husband and son threw the dinner I made, with the plates, into the trash. What the heck? What are you doing? Ignoring me completely, they began eating the burgers from the grocery store which they had spread on the table. Why have you been ignoring me all this time? I asked for a reason but both my husband and son just silently ate their burgers, as if they couldn't hear me. I felt like I had become invisible. After finishing, they returned to their rooms, leaving the mess behind. Crying, I picked up the plates from the trash can. I ended up throwing away the burger trashes they left behind. Since that day, for a whole month, I was treated as if I was non-existent. No matter what I said or did, it was as if I was invisible to them. From about a week later, I gave up and started making meals just for myself. My parents are farmers and they send fresh, delicious vegetables to our house. I used these vegetables to make meals, thinking of my family's health, but it was unbearable to see them thrown away uneaten every day. Eventually, 
even the meals I made for myself got thrown away by them when I wasn't looking. There was even a time when they deliberately crushed the fresh vegetables which my parents sent right in front of me. This is kind of a stress reliever, huh? Why are you doing this? Did I do something wrong? Tell me and I'll fix it. They continued to stomp on the vegetables, laughing mockingly, as if they couldn't see me no matter how much I cried and screamed. Then, my husband did something unbelievable. This one too, no need for it anymore, I'll throw it away. It wouldn't fetch much even if I sold it. He took off his wedding ring from his left ring finger and threw it into the trash can. It was supposed to be the symbol of our precious bond. That was the last straw for me, and I shut my heart down. I couldn't believe he would go as far as to throw away our wedding ring. What is he thinking? My sadness and anger finally reached the limit. I secluded myself in my room. From behind my room's door, I could hear my husband and son laughing together, which only deepened my sorrow. Why did things turn out this way? What happened to them? Confused and distressed, I spent a month crying alone in my room. One late night. While walking to the bathroom, I overheard a joyful conversation of my husband and my son from the living room. I felt lonely, knowing I was no longer part of their world. But then, they started a video call with someone, and the conversation that ensued was unbelievable. Sophie, you look beautiful today, too. You're nothing like my wife. I wish I could marry you soon. Really? Ditch that wrinkled and spotted woman fast, and marry Sophie. I'd be so happy to have such a beautiful mom. I couldn't hear the other person's voice, but my husband and son were praising someone over the phone. Mother? What are they talking about? It was unbelievable. From their conversation, it was clear my husband was having an affair, and my son knew and was encouraging it. Their terrible conversation continued. Lucy really is a foolish woman, isn't she? Now that she's shut herself in her room, we don't have to see her wrinkled, spotted face, which is such a relief. <laughs> it's hilarious. She really seems to know we can't see her. They were mocking me. I felt my heart was freezing. I knew my husband was working hard but was being passed over for promotion at work. I believed my son was just being rebellious because of his age. That's why I had been patient until now. But this? This was too much. What was my endurance for? Knowing the truth ignited the anger that had been smoldering inside me. I couldn't forgive this, not even because they were family. At that moment, I decided to take revenge. For the next two months, I researched my husband's mistress, waiting for the right moment for revenge. Then, one day, my husband approached me. Hey, I need to talk to you. Oh, it's been a while since you came to talk to me. Are you done ignoring me? Yeah, you're of no use to me anymore. My husband handed me divorce papers with a nasty smile. And my son was grinning beside him. I've found someone else. Leave this house. I took the divorce papers from the table with no expression. Fine. I answered. They were surprised, as if they didn't expect my agreement. Huh? You know things very well. We could have divorced sooner then? I had a feeling it would come to this. I already packed. I'll leave tomorrow morning. Oh, okay. Anything else you want to say? What do you want me to say? Beg you not to throw me away? No, just, just sign the divorce papers. My husband seemed a bit let down, but I didn't care and signed the papers, returning them to him. They probably didn't expect that things wouldn't go so smoothly. They looked at each other, but then laughed, as if it was fine as long as I agreed to the divorce. I wonder how long their smug smiles will last. They had no idea that hell was waiting for them after this. The only one who knew it at this point was me. I was laughing inside myself. The next day, I packed my bags and decided to go back to my parents' house. Then, thank you for everything up to now. You really don't regret it? I can reconsider if you want. Why? 
you're the one who wanted a divorce, right? Did you think I'd be crying and begging you to stay? What did you say? Dad, it's fine. We won't be troubled without a woman like her. That's true. She's a woman who no longer matters to us. My husband seemed to have mixed feelings about me agreeing so easily to the divorce. But that was no longer of my business. The husband I loved had already changed. The husband I knew before would never have treated me like I didn't exist or laughed in such an unpleasant way. I felt the last 15 years of our marriage were in vain. Goodbye. Please take care. What happens to them after this has nothing to do with me. After all, my husband himself said that I no longer mattered to them. Upon my return to my parents' home, they welcomed me warmly. Dad, Mom, I'm sorry. The vegetables you sent were either thrown away or trampled on by my husband and son, and they all went to waste. I truly felt sorry for not being able to appreciate my parents' kindness. Wasting food brings punishment. I've seen plenty of people like them suffering. My father was concerned about the scars of my heart. Feeling the warmth of my parents after a long time, I couldn't stop my tears. Meanwhile, the hell for my ex-husband and son was just beginning. Within a week of our divorce and returning to my parents' house, my ex-husband and son came rushing to our doorstep. The moment they saw my face as I opened the door, they started making a scene. Lucy, help us! We were deceived! That's what I told you, Dad, it was suspicious. No, you never said that. You were happy about getting a beautiful mother instead of Lucy. Hearing their ugly quarrel, I managed to keep from laughing and responded calmly. What? You just realized? Shouldn't it have been obvious? You're really foolish. You knew about it? Of course. Sophie, right? There's no way a woman that beautiful would be interested in a man like you. My ex-husband gasped in surprise. Sophie was my husband's mistress. He was quite shocked that I knew what Sophie looked like. Actually, after hearing their conversation in the living room, I sneaked out of my room while they were sleeping and checked my ex-husband's phone, which was charging in the living room. The phone was locked, probably as a precaution, but I knew he used his birthday as the password, so it was easy to open. I was astounded by his lack of security awareness and how he underestimated me, thinking I wouldn't know his birthday. Well, anyways, I opened his text messages and found a lot of exchanges between him and Sophie, like a couple in love. Just thinking about it now makes me nauseous. But Sophie's profile picture was too beautiful to be true. She has exotic features on her face, so beautiful that she could be an idol or a celebrity. No, it was definitely suspicious. There was no reason for such a beautiful woman to be attracted to an average man like him. So, I did an image search with Sophie's photo. Nowadays, you can search the internet using photos, not just keywords. That's when a shocking truth came to light. That Sophie, she's actually a middle-aged man, just like you. There was a warning posted on the internet about a marriage scam artist. Just to be sure, I asked a police officer friend from my school days, and it turned out to be true. Even a famous manga artist got caught in this kind of scam and lost $750,000. No, no way! I did a video call with her. It was definitely that beautiful woman. My husband was desperately trying to deny it, seemingly unwilling to believe. My son too, was dumbfounded, thinking it couldn't be a scam. But suddenly, we couldn't get in touch anymore just as we were about to get married. She ran off with our money. Oh, you donated quite a lot, didn't you? I believe that beautiful woman was going to be my mom. We even talked through video calls. But nowadays, you know, even in video calls, with software, a man can pretend to be a woman. Did you know? These days, gender transformation tools can change one's gender and appearance in calls, making them look like a completely different person. The voice can be easily altered from male to female, and the facial expressions change during the conversation, so it's hard to tell it's fake. It's truly a terrifying era. No way! 
My Sophie is a middle-aged man? When I saw Sophie's real face on the internet, I laughed so hard at the difference. Horrible, mom. You knew and still abandoned us? I lost my savings too. Horrible? Have you already forgotten what you have done to me? Listening to them act as if they were the victims, all I could do was shaking my head. Ignoring me as if I didn't exist, not responding when I spoke to you, throwing away the meals I made. At the end, you chose to divorce. You were the ones who went away first. Never call me mom again. What? You're still mad? I'm sorry, let's make up. We're family, right? We're strangers now. So I don't care. This is the end you chose. Take responsibility for your own choices. When I rejected them, my son begged even more. Don't say that. I'm your son, right? Help me, at least. What? That's not fair, Frederick. Trying to save yourself? It's dad's fault for being tricked in the first place. There's a good investment, we'll share the profits, how could you not suspect that? You were happy to become rich and handed over all your savings too. I was tired of hearing their endless and unpleasant bickering. Our family was destroyed by a single scam artist. If my ex-husband hadn't cheated, maybe we would still be a happy family now. But it's too late. Um, it's a waste of time, can you leave? As I tried to close the front door, my ex-husband begged me. Wait! Please, let's start over! Your parents are farmers, right? So even if we have no money, we won't starve. Are you saying you want to reconcile with me for food? No, it's not like that, I just... I need you! I know it too late, but forgive me. I won't do it again. His obvious excuses only made me sigh. Such men will surely repeat the same mistakes. I decided to put an end to it. Wasting food brings punishment. I've seen many like you suffering. What are you talking about all of a sudden? It's my parents' teaching. You threw away the vegetables they lovingly grew without even eating them. Understand? I'm angry. I will never forgive you. Don't ever show your face to me again. With that, I closed the door. Wait! Mom, forgive me! They kept making a scene at the front door, causing a neighborhood disturbance, so I called the police to take them away. Later, I heard that my ex-husband lost all his money and was fired for embezzling company funds. My son dropped out of high school and is working, but he can't find a good job. The marriage scam artist was recently arrested, according to the news. He was a middle-aged man, nothing like the beautiful woman, and many men were deceived on social media. As for me, I'm helping out on my parents' farm, living a stress-free and healthy life. I'm soon going to be introduced to a man of my age who's also a farmer in the same area. Next time, I want to build a happy family.